The Diary of a Nobody by Georgian Whedon Grossmith Adapted by Andrew Lynch Episode 1 We settled down in our new home and I resolved to keep a diary. It is a great compliment coming to the Laurels for tea and cake, Reverend. I'm grateful for the invitation, Mr and Mrs Pooter. The Laurels, a delightful name. Yes, uh, in Brickfield Terrace. I, I apologise again for your fall over our scraper. My own fault entirely, Mrs Pooter, although it is in an unusual place. And must be removed. It is on my list. I must show you our garden, Reverend. I'm sure you'll be as entranced as I am at its splendour. Are you uh, a train enthusiast? The passing trains are a nuisance. Still, Charles has had his wish come true, being closer to his beloved principal, Mr Perkup, and his office in the city. We are now much too convenient for Charles's friends, Gowing and Cummings, to pop in at the drop of a hat. I'm told it's the latest colour, burnt ochre. Just looks like plain old mustard to me. Oh, with a very distinctive smell. It's the smell of new paint, Gowing. Don't be such a fuss pot. Gentlemen to see you, sir. Side entrance, as instructed. Thank you, sir. Pardon me, Gowing. Oh, burnt ochre... In my opinion, the front parlour is small, not modest, as described by Charles. The front steps are akin to the Alps, and we must use a side entrance on a regular basis, or gain elephant thighs. You are, sir? Farmerson. I am Munger. You asked me to call Mr Pooter? Ah, yes. Thank you for doing so. I have made a list. The bells. The bells? To be seen to. The parlour bell is broken and the front door bell rings up in the servant's bedroom, which is ridiculous. A bedroom door key needs replacing and I require a notice informing tradesmen to report to the side entrance. On the way now, Pooter. So soon going. Infernal smell of paint. Essential in our refurbishment. Will that be all, Mr Pooter? For now, Farmerson. Going. Mind the... Oh! Scraper. Rat it, Pooter! Good day, Mr Farmerson. Good day, Mr Pooter. Oh, uh... I won't bother your servant to close the side door as I see another tradesperson arriving, Mr Pooter. Thank you for the observation, Mr Farmerson. Mr Charles Pooter. I am indeed, sir. Mr Horwin Butcher. Oh, that's a damned awful place to have a scraper. Uh, yes, quite, Mr Farmerson. Mr Horwin, you say? You left your card asking me to call round. Indeed I did. Being most impressed with the cleanliness of your shop. And what can I do for you, Mr Pooter? Let me see. Shoulder of mutton for tomorrow? As a trial? A trial? My reputation makes a trial unnecessary, Mr Pooter. We don't know your reputation, Mr Horwin, and ask you not to be offended. A shoulder of mutton tomorrow will dictate our future relationship. Oh, I'll accept that, Mr Pooter. Very good, Mr Horwin. Mind the scraper as you leave. Mr Pooter, sir. Oh, yes, sir. I feel duty-bound to warn against ordering more goods from callers, as I know for a fact. Mrs Pooter herself has ordered a pound of fresh butter and a pound and a half of salt ditto from a Mr Borset, the butter man. Goodness knows what else. Thank you, Sarah. And a uh, shilling's worth of eggs. I shall warn my delivery boy about that scraper. <laughs> Good morning, Carrie. I've instructed server to boil me two eggs. I didn't request anything for you, as you've been in such a sound sleep. Uh, having been disturbed in the early hours by a very long, very noisy, rattling locomotive. I'm sorry to hear that. I didn't. <laughs> I'm now quite used to the trains. Oh, lucky for you. You started breakfast alone, then? I couldn't wait. It was only last week I commented that I found it disgraceful how late some of the young clerks are at arriving... I told three of them that if Mr Perkup heard of it, they might be discharged. I hope Mr Perkup noted you asserting your authority. I'm not sure you're fully appreciated at the firm. He was out at the time, which prompted me to make the comment, and I'm not sure my good advice was appreciated. Mm. Really? Pitt, very much a junior, who has only been with us six weeks, told me to keep my hair on. 
I informed him I had the honour of being with the firm 20 years, to which he insolently replied that I looked it. <laughs> what did you say to that? I gave him an indignant look and said, I demand from you some respect, sir. He replied, all right, go on demanding. I would not argue with him any further. I cannot argue with people like that. Mm. Your eggs, sir. Mrs. Peter. Um, just tea and uh, toast, please, Sarah. Oh. Oh. Whatever's the matter, Charles? You look quite paled. It's the eggs. Well, are they not to your liking? Oh, decidedly not. Simply shocking. Old stock, if I'm not mistaken. Sarah. Yes, Mrs. The Peter. eggs are not fresh. Oh. I'd say worse. I'd say adult, Mrs. Pewter. They're the ones what come with the butter from Mr. Borset. Then I insist they must be returned to Mr. Borset with my compliments and a note stating he needn't call for any more orders. There's worse to come, sir. Being? It's pouring down with rain, sir. I don't think we can blame Borset for that. No, but you can blame Mr. Gowing taking your umbrella in mistake for his stick, which he's left in the hall stand. Oh, poor Charles. I'm going to get soaked going to work. Dear Diary, William Lupin Pooter, our beloved son, is far away, toiling in a bank in Oldham and enjoying the company and hospitality of his northern cousins, while we face the trials of moving to Brickfield Terrace without his support. His father is engaged in very unsatisfactory relations with the local tradesmen. The egg man is proving to be particularly difficult. Oh, Charles, I'm so glad to see you home. How was your day? A disastrous start that got mercifully better. Oh, did you get very wet? No. Charles, we've got some... Allow me to unburden the travails of the day. Before you do, I just... Due to oh. sheltering from the confounded rain, I was half an hour late at the office. That's awful, Charles. Now Can at I... last, I am at peace in my own citadel. Not quite, Charles. There's someone to see you in the parlour. Mr Borsett, supplier of eggs... My husband, Mr. Pooter. Ah, home at last, I see. I beg your pardon, Mr. Borset. I've waited because I'm struck livid by your actions, Pooter. Are you drunk, sir? Do not insult me further than criticising the freshness of my eggs. I suppose you think you know all about eggs, being an important man of the city, as your maid informs me. Borset, <laughs> I know enough of eggs to pronounce them addled. Addled? My eggs! Clarks! Don't be hanged before I serve another city clerk with a hag ever again! I shall serve only gentlemen with my eggs! Well, I consider it highly possible for a city clerk, such as myself, to be a gentleman. <coughs> Such self regard is not worth a candle! <laughs> Dreadful man. <gasps> He's fallen over the scraper. The chapter is closed. How was your day, my dear? Quite busy. I'm afraid we have two shoulders of mutton. You having arranged with another butcher without consulting me. Oh? In the light of... Um, we could keep both to save embarrassment. Ah, yes. No. It is an honest mistake on your part, but I shall see to rectifying it. Dear diary, Charles, with a perversity which is just like him, placed an order for mutton with the butcher without consulting me when I had already ordered mutton with our usual man. Oh, dearie, dearie me. In all my years supplying meat, game, and assortments of finest product to gentry, gentry, sir, not city clerks, I have never known a return of mutton or anything else ordered in good faith. My dear sir, I admit an honest mistake, and for the sake of future orders... Future orders? There will be none. Rest assured of that. I do not want your custom. Then what are you making all this fuss about it for? Pa! Go along. Oh, I could buy up things like you by the dozen. Oh. That was a little awkward, as I'm sure we see him in church. Well, then you really should have told me about having ordered mutton carrots. Charles, before we moved, you were happy to leave grocery shopping to me and Sarah. I suggest that you... Mr. Puda! He's at the letterbox. I shall be bringing a court action against you, Mr. Puder, for returning a shoulder of mutton. For causing me to cut myself on your blasted scraper. My sincere apologies, Mr. Horwin. You should have that scraper seen too. Good day to you, sir. Should we put a notice up as a warning, do you think, sir? No, sir, no. 
I must get it removed or else I shall get into a scrape myself. <laughs> <laughs> I don't often make jokes, but that was rather good. <laughs> really tells. I'll contact Farmer and the Ironmonger. Right, sir. Oh, very good. Ask him to join me, please, Sarah. Oh, and ma'am as well, please. Oh, I think Mrs. Peter is busy with something. Tell her to leave whatever she's doing, and she'll enjoy the diversion. Oh. <laughs> Working hard, Peter, and enjoying the experience. But I've discovered something about our home, sweet home, Carrie. What is it, Charles? I am rather busy. This is important, my dear wife. What? I have just discovered we have a lodging house. How do you mean? Look at the borders. <laughs> oh, Is that all you wanted me for? Any other time, you would have left it my little pleasantry. Certainly, at any other time, but not when I am busy in the house. I thought it was bordering on amusing, Pooter. <laughs> bordering... <laughs> Yes. I thought we'd play dominoes when Gowing arrives. Oh, splendid suggestion, Pooter. Gowing will be pleased you have a gang of men working on the removal of that scraper. He's convinced the contraption has it in for him. A gang? Palmerston told me he'd do the job himself, as it was so minor. Well, he has at least three helpers at the moment. Oh. Palmerston! Why so many men and such a large hole for the removal of a small scraper? It was a stupid place to put it. Why so? Right above a gas pipe. Whoever fitted it there was no tradesman, in my opinion. And who will foot the bill, Farmerson? The man who commissioned the job, of course. Sounds like it's you, Pooter. Oh, sorry to disturb you, sir, but Borset, him of the eggs, is here. Does he want? Definitely not trouble. He's looking very sorrowful. Ah, Borset. What brings you back to the laurels? I wish to offer an explanation for my behaviour the last time I was here. Uh, <clears throat> I'd enjoyed myself far too much, uh, compensating for a missed bank holiday, and having had excess of intoxicating drink was over upset at the returned hags. Oh. This is most unexpected. I offer a pound of fresh butter as a practical apology and hope you can find it in your heart to forgive me. My dear Mr. Borset, a gentleman proves himself in dignified actions, not pompous, pretentious rhetoric. Of course I forgive you. Ah. I accept the butter with gratitude and place an order for half, nay, a dozen fresh eggs with you. <laughs> Certainly, Mr. Potter, sir. May I come in? You're not going to complain of the smell of paint, are you, Cummings? No, but I'll tell you what. I distinctly smell dry rot. You're talking a lot of dry rot yourself. <laughs> Hear that, Gary? He's talking a lot of dry rot himself. <laughs> oh, yes, dear. How amusing. Oh. I don't want to laugh again so soon at one of your jokes as my sides still ache with laughter from the last one. I'll uh, leave you both to it. See you later, dear. Would you serve it to serve us some drinks? Yes, dear. By the by, my cousin Merton has just set up in the wine and spirits trade and has a splendid whisky four years in the bottle at 38 shillings. It's worth your while laying down a few dozen of it. I'd be very tempted, but my cellars are quite full up. Don't be put off by the price. He has a vast range of product. I can assure you the price is of no concern. Oh, please, sir. The grocer says he ain't got no more Kinahan, but you'll find this very good at two and six with tuppence returned on the bottle. And please, did you want any more sherry, as he has some at one and three as dry as a nut? Uh, thank you, sir, but don't trouble him. Mr Cummings has a cousin who may be more to my needs. Most certainly. D. 
Did I, Ree? Only woken four times last night by trains. Charles was too, but he feigned a sound sleep. I am hoping my friend Mrs. James of Sutton will visit soon, as all of our callers are male, and mostly named Gowing and Cummings. Mr. Cummings, Mr. Gowing to see you, sir. Thank you, sir. Booter. <laughs> Always made very welcome by yourself and Carrie. We're so used to you dropping in. Gowing and Cummings have taken to calling of an evening unannounced in a most familiar way and staying for supper and several games of dominoes and whist. <laughs> we spend considerable sums on bottles of Kinner and whiskey, which seem to last no time at all. May I come in? Hello, Cummings. Your maid opened the door and asked me to excuse her showing me in as she's wringing out some socks. I'm delighted to see you. I just popped in with the bicycle news. But we might play a hand or two of whist. Just the two of us? Well, we could play with a dummy hand. All right. You can be the dummy. <laughs> Funny as usual. Uh, oh, going unannounced. A maid asked me to enter without ceremony, ringing out socks. Oh, hello. I wondered who'd come in. A maid ringing out socks. <clears throat> A very extraordinary thing has struck me. Something funny, as usual? Yes, I think you will say so this time. It's concerning you both. Doesn't it seem odd that Gowing's always coming and Cummings always going? <laughs> I, I think that's one of the best jokes I've ever made. It's certainly up to your usual standard. Thank you, Carrie. What's the matter with you two? I think after that I shall be going. And I'm sorry I failed to see the fun of your jokes. I'm terribly sorry, Cummings. Did you appreciate the pleasantry going? No, Pooter, in truth I did not. I don't mind a joke when it isn't rude. But a pun on a name is certainly wanting in good taste. I'd go further. If it had been said by anyone else but you, Pooter, I should never have entered the house again. I wish you a pleasant evening. As do I. I think this visit is best written off. Mm. We'll see ourselves out. There's a letter for you, sir. Thank you, sir. Oh. This looks most important. The ivory-handled letter opener, please. Oh. Charles? Whatever is the matter? Your ration? What's in the letter? Oh. Oh, is it bad news? No, decidedly not. Well, then. My dear Carrie. Oh, my dear, dear Carrie. Just tell me, Charles. We've been invited to the mansion house by the Lord and Lady Murress. Oh, surely not. Oh, it must be some mistake. Let me get to your song. An invitation to Mr and Mrs Charles Pooter to attend a reception at the mansion house. Oh, Charles! What's beating like an excited schoolboy? Oh, Charles, you are one of the representatives of trades and commerce. Carrie, darling, I was a proud mum when I led you down the aisle of the church on our <laughs> wedding day. And, uh, that pride will be equalled, if not surpassed, when I lead you, my dear pretty wife, up to the Lord and Lady Murress at the mansion house. Oh, and I am very, very proud of you. You call me pretty, and uh, as long as I am pretty in your eyes... I am happy. <laughs> you, dear old Charlie, are not handsome, but you are good, which is far more noble. Oh, this says I will be dancing. We haven't danced for years. No, but we will now. Oh, oh, oh Charles, steady. <laughs> Think you of the ornaments. Dance the polka. <laughs> you should see me come the floor. Dear diary, <laughs> I have never known Charles so happy and more deserving to receive such an invitation. We've never failed to stand and admire the mansion house when walking past, and now to be invited in. We're bursting with pride. My darling wife. My wife and I would Excuse be... Excuse me, sir. Sarah, you have specific instructions not to disturb me. If going or Cummings have visited, then they must be told I'm far too busy fashioning a reply to the murder murderess to see them. There's no visitors, sir. Mrs. Pooter wanted to know if you'd like a cup of tea, as you've been at it for hours. Mrs. Pooter knows a reply to such an important invitation is not a simple matter. Yes, I will take tea, please, sir. Yes, sir. 
on behalf of my wife Caroline in reply to your most generous invitation to the mansion house I Charles Pooter and Mrs Caroline Pooter gratefully accept I will carry for taking an awful long time did you consult Mr Perkup? indeed I did and whilst I can see it, our principal must be far more used to replying to very important invitations, I thought his advice to keep it simple not quite enough. However, as ever, I've concluded Mr Perkup knows best. While you've been concentrating on your reply, I've turned my attention to what we'll wear at the mansion house. Mrs James of Sutton has agreed to come up and help me dress on the day. Very sensible, Kelly. I'll send my dress coat and trousers to the little tailors around the corner to have the creases taken out and... I'll buy a new pair of boots. Uh, Emma, I suggest you take your shirt to Trillips, as the front and cuffs are much frayed. I'm frayed they are. <laughs> oh, 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 do you understand, Gary? Yes, yes, Charles. Very amusing. Dear diary. Oh, dearie, dearie me. I'm frayed they are frayed, Mr Trillip. They're bound to do that, sir. Frayed so. <laughs> yes, quite... Would you return it to the Lovells, Brickfield Terrace, when repaired, please? Yes, Mr Pooter. Anything else? Yes, sir, there will be. Doesn't every day one's invited up to the mansion house by the Lord Murder and Lady Murders? I'll take that pair of lavender kid gloves and a white tie. Very good, sir. Make that too, in case one is spoiled in the tying. As the day of the mansion house ball draws near, I have written to our dear son William in Oldham to share our joy. And Charles has been at great pains to let all of our friends know of our invitation. Sarah, I want you to deliver these notes. One to Mr Gowing and one to Mr Cumming. Very important notes telling them not to call next Monday as Mrs Putin and myself will be at the mansion house in the company of the Lord Mayor and Lady Murress. Post not good enough, sir. Certainly not. I need to know they've been opened, read and understood. As you will, sir. Mr Trillip, for you, sir. All right, sir, thank you. You deliver those notes and I'll see to Trillip. Here you are, sir. My fee is on this invoice. It's five shillings. That's more than I paid for the shirt. New, Mr Trillip. Well, it's better now than when it was new, Mr Pooter. I have to say, this is tantamount to daylight robbery. I'm sorry you feel that way, Mr Pooter, but if you wanted your shirt front made out of pauper linen, such as is used for packing and book binding, why didn't you say so? I've no more time to waste on this matter, Trillip. I've new boots to buy for my special occasion. Dear Diary, very little sleep last night, but due to excitement rather than trains. Almost 11 o'clock, Harry. I know, I know. Only seven hours to oh, go. Please don't keep informing me of the time, Charles. But where is Mrs James of Sutton? Is she helping to dress you or what? Has the train been delayed? Has she fallen ill? Has she somehow got the date wrong? Mrs James has arrived, Mrs oh, Peter. Oh, thank goodness for that. Oh, go and busy yourself with other things now, Charles, not forgetting to scuff the soles of your new boots and leave me to prepare. Where are you dashing to this time, sir? Just something for the missus, sir. But how long am I to be banned from the bedroom? You're to dress in the parlour, sir. I've put all your requirements in there. Moustache! But... Well, really. Oh. Sarah! Two cabbages and coal blocks, as requested. What are you doing, boy? Don't throw us. Just, just delivering, sir. Look at my shirt! It's very nice. It was. Now it's made with cabbage and coal dust, stupid boy. It's not my fault, sir. I'm in a rush. Don't tell on me. Please don't tell on me. Of course not. Wait. Oh, oh you've dropped a cabbage. Should I retrieve it? No, it's fine. Here, take a penny. Oh, thank you, sir. I'm sorry, sir. It's all right. Time to clean up. Ah. Oh, sir, are you all right? Apart from cabbage smears, cold dust on my shirt, a twisted ankle and a cut chin, I'm fine. Oh, good. I'll go back upstairs to see to the missus. But, Sarah! Oh! Oh, 
wake up, Charles. No, no. No, what time is it? You're not at off waiting. Sorry to take so long. Oh, my darling Carrie, you are worth every second waiting. You look like a queen. Never have I seen you look so lovely or so distinguished. Oh, thank you, Charles. I asked Mrs. James if I could borrow this dress, knowing it was your favourite colour of blue. And the ivory fan, Charles. Too much? Or? Don't change a thing, Carrie. My dear, dear wife. You will be the belle of the ball, and I will be the proudest husband at the mansion house. <laughs> Dear Diary, Charles has questioned every detail, and we're very well prepared for our honour of attending the mansion house this evening. Isn't it wonderful to be among these sort of people? Yes, Charles. But a little overwhelming. Don't be. We're here on merit, having been invited by the Lord Mayor himself. Mr Perkup said he was envious because he had a previous engagement and couldn't attend. It's a pity we don't know anybody. I think we might. Isn't that Franching from Peckham over don't there? Don't leave me. <laughs> 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 at me. Don't be silly, Carrie. Sip more champagne. We're here with the higher echelons of society. Nobody knowing us is to our advantage, as our status can be taken as anything. Oh, ah, supper served. Oh, Tucking along with everyone else. Dear diary, my stars, it was a splendid supper, with any amount of champagne. I'm delighted to see you've made a most hearty supper, Carrie. It was wonderful. And if we had the means, I'd resolve to drink nothing but champagne ever again. I heartily agree. <laughs> Let's circulate prior to dancing. All right. I'm pleased your confidence is boosted, having become familiar with the surroundings. Oh, we're as good as the best here. <laughs> Within our range, Carrie. There are many, many very important people here, and I aim to converse with some of them. What ho, Pooter! <laughs> is this better than the Laurels Brickfield Terrace, eh? Farmerson, I never expected to see you here. I like that. If you, why not me? Yes, of course. Can I get your jolly old lady anything? Uh, no, I thank you. May I remind you that you've yet to finish resurfacing after removing the scraper and damaging the gas pipe. Pardon me, Mr. Pooter, no business talk. We're in company. Please. Must move on. Lots of familiar faces. To think a man who mends our scraper should be here mixing in these circles. Charles, he must have earned his invitation the same as you have. Let's have some more champagne. After we dance. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> and forevermore, we can say we have danced at the mansion house as guests of the Lord Mur. <laughs> Come along, my darling wife. <laughs> oh! Oh! oh. 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 What's happened? Are they all right? Help them up. Who are they? Not dancers, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know them. It's Pooter. Considers himself quite the hag expert. Help us up, please, boss. Of course I will. Now, what happened? Charles slipped. Having not taken my advice to scuff the soles of his new boots and drag me down with him. I am so, so sorry. No harm done, I hope. Are you all right, dear? As far as I know. Oh, are you the chap who fell down? Yes, Farmerson. Oh, he's the chap who returned a shoulder of mutton. Ah, oh, oh, in the butcher. Fancy seeing you here. I have thought never to see him again, Borset. First time here, Mr. Pooter. Oh, it is Pooter. I wasn't sure. Oh, you're here as well, Mr. Trillip. Afraid I am, sir. Will you be needing more shirt repairs after your little mishap? <laughs> <laughs> I feel decidedly groggy. You took quite a tumble. You all right, Mrs. Pooter? Yes, thank you. Get back on the floor and dance, Pooter. <laughs> Leave him be, Borset. Come and have another glass. That's more in our line. A splendid suggestion, Farmerson. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Charles was poorly all night long after the ball, leaving me to bar the scullery door and feed the cat, and he had to call at Brownish the chemist for a curative this morning. I do believe I've been poisoned by the lobster mayonnaise at the mansion house last night. Don't take me for a fool, Charles Pooter. 
Regarding what? My ability to ascertain the cause of your so-called illness. We both know it was not lobster mayonnaise. Champagne never did agree with you. Caroline! I'm astounded at the insinuation. Although it be theatrical, it has no effect on me. Reserve that tone for your new friend, Mr. Farmerson, the ironmonger. As far as I'm concerned, Carrie, I've done nothing you can reproach me for, and that's an end to it. Really? Yes. Oh, permit me to jog your memory about last night. Following your collapse to the dance floor, dragging me with you... My new bo- I said... What happened next? After professing to snub Mr. Farmerson, you permit him to snub you in my presence and then accept his invitation to take a glass of champagne with you and you don't limit yourself to one glass. That's you then work. offer this vulgar man who made a bungle of repairing our scraper a seat in our cab on the way home I say nothing about his tearing my dress and getting in the cab nor of treading on Mrs James's expensive fan which you knocked out of my hand and for which he never even apologised but I... you smoked all the way home without having the decency to ask my permission but that is not all at the end of the journey Although he did not offer you a farthing towards his share of the cab, you asked him in. Fortunately, he was sober enough to detect from my manner that his company was not desirable. Charles and I have settled our differences over the matter of Mr. Farmerson in the cab after the ball. But I was startled to see him return this evening with a large number of newspapers. What are you doing with ten, eleven, no, twelve copies of the Blackfriars Bi-Weekly News? I bought them to send to our friends. Why? Because there was to be a list of names in it of all who attended the Mansion House Ball. Was to be? There is a list of all who attended. Except us. We have been overlooked. (laughs) I am amazed at that, seeing as how you put us firmly at the centre of things, crashing to the dance floor, dragging me down with you. Merely an accident sympathetically witnessed by all. Now, if you'll excuse me, I need to put pen to paper. Who are you writing to? The Blackfriars Bi-Weekly News, pointing out their omission. How many this time? Just the one. Usual copy of the Blackfriars Bi-Weekly News. Have they replied? Not as such. Ah... Clarifications, corrections, and most importantly, omissions. Here we are. They state that several names have been omitted. Mr. and Mrs. C. Pot. Porter. Porter. Porter! Stupid, stupid people! They tried, Charles. And they must try again. Porter. In capitals. There shouldn't be any possible mistake this time. Dear Diary. Oh, dearie, dearie me. <coughs> well? Wait a moment. Ah. As an aside to clarifications, corrections and omissions, and I quote, we have received two letters from Mr and Mrs Charles Pewter requesting us to announce the important fact that they were at the Mansion House Ball. <laughs> Pewter. Pewter! Will there be a third letter? No, Carrie. My time is far too valuable to bother about such trifles. Mm. Dear Diary, today I have written to our dear son William in Oldham, telling him how much I miss his company and the vicissitudes of our life in Brickfield Terrace, and sending him birthday greetings with a small gift. I've received a letter from our son, thanking me for sending him cufflinks for his 20th birthday. Oh, very good. Is he well? I believe so, but rather intriguingly, after he thanks me for his delivery, he tells me to expect one of my own this afternoon. Whatever could he be sending us from Oldham, I wonder? And we did not have to wait long to discover exactly what that delivery was to be. William, my dear boy, what a wonderful surprise. What a tease you are, not explaining that you yourself are the surprise package. Hello, old things. <laughs> Got leave from the bank, and as Monday's a holiday, thought I'd give you a little surprise. Oh, such a lovely surprise it is. You've lost weight. Are oh, you not eating properly up in old? I'm eating almost as heartily as I would at home, old girl. Don't fret about that. Mm-hmm. Your cousins send their love and all that guff. 
How kind. You're going to show me around the new place, then? Yes, then we can settle down and exchange our news. You'll be surprised by the back garden. Mm, and how close we are to the railway line. The special port, sir, The prodigal has returned. Yes, sir. Is that everything, sir? No, it isn't. You've not finished yet. Charles? You must pour yourself a glass of port, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sir. Join us in a toast, Sarah. To your health, William. Welcome home, darling Willie. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, sir. I'll leave you to it. Thank you, Sarah. Oh, by the by, did I tell you I've got my first name William and taken the second name Lupin? Uh, in fact, I'm only known in Oldham as Lupin Pooter. If you were to willy me that, they wouldn't know what you meant. Huh? Oh? Lupin was never intended as a Christian name. Just mother's family name to be kept alive. And a fine name. Good old mother. <laughs> of course, you must call yourself whatever you think fit, within reason. But I thought William a nice, simple name after Uncle William, who was much respected in the city. Oh, I know all about that. Good old Bill. You mind if I take a refill? Yes, of course, my dear Willie. Lupin, as our prodigal is known at the bank. Mm. I hope you are happy with your colleagues. Not really. There's not one clerk who's a gentleman and the boss is a cad. <laughs> Doesn't sound too good. Oh, I, I expect Lupin's feeling jaded from the journey and will have a more positive perspective in the morning. Hmm. It is my dearest wish to see you as settled in your employment as I am. Working for Mr. Perkham. Let's top up our glasses and drink to his health. <laughs> <laughs> William, it's almost nine o'clock and we breakfast at eight thirty. How long will he be? I'd greatly appreciate a little while longer, Gov. Gov. Blue pin, dear. It's half past one and, and we dine at two. I'll be there, Mother. A quarter to three. We've not seen much of you over the weekend and then you'll have to return by the 5.30 train. Let the boy enjoy his meal, Charles. I am simply pointing out he'll have to leave in an hour and he'll go by the midnight mail. Look here, Governor. It's no use beating about the bush. I've tendered my resignation at the bank. Get my... Probably a bit of a shock, but that's it, I'm afraid. Are you going to say something coherent, Charles? Yes, I am. And not much to say, really. The decision's been taken. How dare you, sir? How dare you take such a serious step without consulting me? You will write a note at my dictation, withdrawing your resignation and amply apologising for your thoughtlessness. <laughs> It's no use. If you want the good old truth, I've got the chalk. Dear diary. Oh, dearie, dearie me. Hello, Charles. How was the office? I felt duty bound to inform Mr. Perkup of our circumstances regarding William. Lupin. As I expected, Mr. Perkup was very understanding and equally wise in his counsel. We concluded that William... Lupin. Will Mr. Perkup take him on? He and I concluded that Lupin hasn't taken to Oldham or been away from his family, which has clouded his judgment and caused a lack of interest in his job at the bank. With Mr. Perkup's help, I'm sure we can secure him a position in the city. Dear diary, I should have known it. For all my husband's dedicated loyalty to his firm, I suspect that his own importance within it is a self-delusion. His principal, Mr. Perkup, could find our son no position and left Charles pathetically grateful to be given a list of other possible prospective employers for Lupin. Hello, old thing. Not kept you waiting for supper, have I? As a matter of fact, you have. But not to worry. I have secured for you an introduction to Fripps, Janus and Co. We understand you may be a little down in the dumps, having no success in finding fresh employment. On the contrary, Governor. I'm in fine form, having been elected to be a member of the Holloway Comedians. You are in a state of unemployment, existing totally on our munificent 
and you divert your efforts of finding gainful employment by joining an amateur dramatic club. That's about it, Governor. Just the ticket to take my mind off my woes. The Evening Post for you, sir. Thank you, sir. Fingers crossed, Carrie. Well, Charles? Ah. Well... I wouldn't be too happy if Poolers and Smith did have anything to offer Lupin. They're a very young firm. Of course, my ultimate ambition is to see him alongside me at Mr Perkup's firm. No post being available there yet. I'm sure my principal's contacts will come good for Lupin, who is rather late. I haven't seen him all day. I must say, I wish you hadn't given him a latchkey. He is 20 years old, Charles. I, and many more, had to wait until 21 to receive our key. We never seem to see anything of him since he's gained his independence. Ah, oh, good. And his spirits seem to be up. Hello, you two. Not waited for me, have you? As a matter of fact, we have. And are glad to see you home. Supper, a good night's sleep, and then ready for the fray tomorrow. I have high hopes we'll receive good news from Pattles and Pattles. I've got some good news already. Mm-hmm. You found yourself a post. Let's fill your glasses up and one for me, and then I'll tell oh, you. This is such a relief, Lupin. Don't jump the gun, old girl. <laughs> Cheers. To good health and a solid future. <laughs> and <clears throat> what exactly are we drinking to? My engagement. At which company? Not a company, Governor. A delightful young woman. Uh-huh. I'm engaged to be married. <laughs> you should see me dance the polka. <laughs> you should see me carve the ground. William, Lupin, stop this nonsense at once and explain yourself. Oh, Charles, have you ever seen him happy? <laughs> Will you both please come to your senses? Who is she, Lupin? Never mind that for the moment. <laughs> I cannot believe that you, William, Lupin... Still a mere boy would even consider getting engaged without consulting us. That's exactly what I've done. Who is she, Lupin? Daisy Muppler. The nicest, prettiest, most accomplished girl I've ever met. Oh, Lupin, you're glowing with happiness. With love. I loved her the moment I saw her. But you know means to support yourself, never mind a wife. In time, in time. If, if I have to wait 50 years, then so be it. And I know she'd wait for me. Suddenly, the world is a, is a different place to me now, a world worth living in. I now have a purpose, and that is to make Daisy Motler Daisy Pooter. <laughs> and I know, dear parents, that nay, guarantee, Miss Daisy Motler will not disgrace the family of the Pooters. Oh, Lupin. <laughs> what are people? Oh, uh, Mopla, Williams and Watts. Can't say I've ever heard of them. Oh, Charles, Lupin isn't marrying a company. He's marrying Daisy, who I know I will love as a daughter. Dear Diary, I could not be happier for Lupin, myself and Charles when he comes around to the idea. To top it all, Mr Perkup has helped secure Lupin a post at Cleanins & Co. Stock and Share Brokers. I've obtained agreement from Charles to hold a small party welcoming Daisy Mutler to the laurels. Life is very good. If only the trains would stop running. Daisy, my Daisy. She's looking forward to the party, and so am I. You won't mind if some of the Holloway comedians come along, will you? Oh. How many? Oh, just half a dozen or so, including Daisy's brother, Frank, who's an absolute hoot. Oh, we'll be very pleased to meet them, won't we, dear? I hope this won't distract you too much from the real task in hand. Establishing yourself at Cleanings and Co., stock and share brokers. <laughs> oh, don't worry about that. I hope your levity is superficial and that you appreciate greatly the fact that Mr Perkup himself has vouched for you. Uh, here's a thought. Invite Mr. Perkop to the party as a way of thanks. Very thoughtful, Lupin. For you, we're not quite grand enough for him. There's no offence in asking him. He might just surprise you. He may find it an uncommonly kind gesture from an employee. On consideration, you might be right. I shall send him an invitation. I detest 
these boots. Don't make such a fuss, Charles. The trousers are too short. They're perfectly fine. You should have tried them on before waiting for the night of the party. Your ordinary boots are better than the dress ones. They're higher and no one will notice a slighter gap. The trousers are a bit short, old boy. And why are you wearing dress boots? <clears throat> Your father is uh, dressing for comfort in his own home. I thought you were a stick in the mud about rigid etiquette. My dear son, I have lived to be above that sort of thing. I always thought a man generally was above his boots. <laughs> <laughs> I feel to find that remotely amusing. Oh, oh Charles, it was quite witty. Oh. Guests arriving! Side door! Front door, sir, there. Front door on this occasion. Hello, Pooh. Why, your trousers are too short. You'll find my temper short, also going. That won't make your trousers longer. <laughs> Welcome, Cummings. And Mrs Cummings. Good evening. You didn't say anything about a costume. Isn't fancy dress, is it? Of course not. What with the trousers and boots? Oh, Daisy, you're here at last. Mother, father... I present my fiance, Miss Daisy Mutler, and her brother Frank. Oh, we're very, very pleased to meet you at last, Daisy. My pleasure, Mrs. Pooter. Frank, welcome to the Lovells and to the Pooters. Thank you, Mr. Pooter. <laughs> Daisy is a big woman and at least eight years older than Lupin and, in my estimation, not particularly pleasing on the eye. Mm. But she does seem nice. I wonder if Mr. Perkett will honour us. Oh, Howard, don't be too disappointed if he doesn't. He did say he, he would, if he could, cut short his dining appointment in Kensington. I do hope so. Your efforts at catering should be rewarded by someone with Mr. Perkup's eye and appreciation. Do you really think so, Charles? Oh, Carrie, you and Sarah, under your supervision, have worked so hard. I'd wager there is no better table in the whole of London this night. Look at cakes, open jam puffs and jellies, sandwiches, cold chicken, ham. And the sideboard groans with the weight of the cold beef and pisandu tongue. Oh, we have done our son proud. Well... After the shock, it's only right to celebrate the engagement of our only child to Miss Daisy Mutler. Excellent party, Pooter. Thank you, Cummings. Sir, there. Yes, sir. Put a plate of sandwiches and the best of the sabres and fancies to one side, in case Mr. Perkup arrived. Yes, sir. Some champagne? It's going ever so quickly. Port, I think, sir. Study with the champagne going. Don't want you falling down. Don't be such a fastball, Pooter. If I didn't know better, I'd swear you hadn't eaten for a month prior to tonight. More champagne, anyone? Lupin, it is not a bottomless well. Don't fret, Governor. I'm standing half a dozen bottles myself. How can you afford to add a bit of luck? Made three pounds on a deal in the city. I hope you'll be acting responsibly in your new post at Cleanings and Co. Stock and share brokers. But don't worry about me. I'll soon be an old stick-in-the-mud married man like yourself. Stick in the mud. That's twice tonight. Oh, you daisies ready. <coughs> for what? Song. We're in for a treat. Let the girl rest. She's making us all feel tired by the effort she's putting in. But then it's your turn, Governor. Me? You. If you're so concerned about Daisy overtiring herself, the entertainment duty falls on your shoulders. Doesn't it, party goers? Yeah, yeah come yeah. on, Pooter. We know you can do it. You know you want to. It just needs encouragement. <laughs> oh, Pooter! 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 Very well. It's on page 12, Frank. I've just got here through Paris from the sunny southern shore. I 
to Monte Carlo went just to raise my winter's rent. Dame Fortune smiled upon me as she'd never done before. And I've now such lots of money, I'm a gent. And I've now such lots of money, I'm a gent. As I walk along the Bois Boulogne with an independent heart, you can hear the girls declare he must be a millionaire. You can hear them sigh and wish to die. You can see them wink the other eye at the man who broke the bank at Monte. Mr. Perkup, you're here. No, no, stop throwing in here, in here. Charles, Charles, wake up, wake up. Oh, whatever's the matter? Oh, oh, thank goodness, it was a dream. What's the time? Four in the morning. You've been like a restless octopus since coming to bed. A nightmare. Over and over, the, the house was filled with low people who kept throwing things at Mr. Perkoff. I hid him under a bath towel. Mm. You know champagne never agrees with you. No. I think I ate too hard to leave the side dishes. Mm, it wasn't the side dishes that drove you to sing. Oh, no. In Mr. Perkoff's presence, how can I ever look him in the eye again? <sighs> Mr. Perkoff said he was very amused and enjoyed his visit. He also gave you leave to only arrive at the office at 12 noon, but if you don't sleep now, you're in danger of oversleeping for even that. Good night, Charles. And stop dreaming. Isn't it peaceful? Yes. Just the ticking of the clock and the turning over the pages. Mm. Yes. Quite a fuss sometimes, newspaper. Me with the Black Friars bi-weekly news. Which you said you'd never buy again. Only a petty man would hold a grudge over the spelling mistake. Mm. You with your book. Which I could enjoy in the right circumstances. Do you know, my dear Kerry, for all the so-called delights of enjoying society, I do believe I enjoy nothing better than a quiet evening, sitting, reading, with your silent company. Yes, dear, very sweet. To getting over the shock of Lupin's engagement, I'm now inclined to see the better side. Oh. <clears throat> Finish reading? It seems so, for now. And an early engagement can lead to a very happy marriage. Here we sit. Indeed we do. We married early, and with the exception of a few trivial misunderstandings... We've never really had a serious word. True. It's a matter of putting up with and being forgiving of minor irritations. Exactly. Something I learned to do many years ago. And you yourself have many qualities. Thank you, Charles. I can't help thinking that half the pleasures of life are derived from the little struggles and small privations that one had to endure at the beginning of one's married life. Mm. Such struggles were generally occasioned by want of means. And often help to make loving couples stand together all the firmer. I'm so blessed to be married to quite the philosopher. Thank you for that mm. compliment. I don't pretend to be able to express myself in fine language, but I feel I have the power of expressing my thoughts with simplicity and lucidness. Simplicity is your gift. You should write a book of your thoughts, Charles. <gasps> Funny you should say that. I have thought recently of keeping a diary. I've often seen published reminiscences of people I have never heard of, and I fail to see, because I do not happen to be a somebody, why my diary should not be interesting. I think that would fill your time admirably. My only regret is that I didn't start it when I was a youth. But as we enter the next stage of our lives, with our son about to be married and have a family of his own, it would be a good time to chronicle all the happy events. <laughs> do we have any brandy in the house? No. We have whiskey on the sideboard, but I... Oh. Are you all right, Lupin? Oh. oh. I hope uh, Daisy is well. If you mean Miss Mopler, 
I don't know whether she is well or not, but please never mention her name again in my presence. Good night. Will you be starting your diary this evening? Perhaps not. In episode one of The Diary of a Nobody, Johnny Vegas and Catherine Parkinson played Charles and Kerry Pooter. Lupin was Andrew Gower, and Sarah was Sinead Matthews. Cummings was Adrian Scarborough, and Gowing, Stephen Critchlow. Farmerson was played by Joe Ransom, Trillip by Adam Gillen, and Daisy Mutler was Sarah Sweeney. Other parts were played by members of the company. The Diary of a Nobody is dramatised by Andrew Lynch from the novel by George and Whedon Grossmith. The music was arranged and played by Faze Music. The producer is Sally Harrison and the director is Marilyn Imrie.